good morning and uh, good afternoon for somebody and also good evening for people in uh, asia and india um, this is a very uh, interesting uh, webinar uh, jointly planned by arvind i care system and also several uh, teaching institutions in us which the list which you have already seen uh, so we all know uh, manual small incision cataract surgery is quite popular in uh, the developing world for various reasons because it is very simple it is very manual it does it it's a machine independent and also it's kind of it doesn't involve any uh, uh, things which are very expensive like intraocular lenses or devices so it's it's very cost effective at the end of the day so it's quite popular technique uh, but there is a lot of interest in learning small incision from uh, the developed world also as we see today there are a lot of people have joined from uh, us uh, mainly the reasons being it helps them in international work uh, because you can do everything manually it's kind of cost effective and also fast in the meaning fast is you can do any type of cataract at the same time in sometimes in phaco harder cataracts you may take longer time to emulsify but in small incision it may be much easier to do even brown and black cataracts at the same time and it is very important in dealing with very hard cataracts wherein uh, there is a significant uh, energy which is uh, uh, dissipated when you do a phaco emulsification and also it allows us uh, and gives an option for us for conversion in phaco emulsification when we have difficulties uh, many of the people who are not very well versed in small incision would still convert to an extra cap and suture the wound but if you are good in small incision you can convert into a small incision and still go suture this in most of the cases so with this uh, brief introduction i would uh, uh, like to uh, invite my co-host uh, dr william mayers from northwestern university to introduce the speakers and panelists um hello all uh, welcome to uh, our webinar uh, the genesis of the webinar uh, was I spent two months at Aravind uh, in order to learn this so that I could work in other countries more effectively, and in particular to learn how to teach uh, the, uh, the technique. Uh, so uh, I had a great experience uh, uh, at three locations in uh, India. And I uh, approached Aravind to uh, put on this uh, global uh, webinar. Uh, I chose my background here to show uh, global uh, M6 uh, Corona webinar. And so I'll hide the bright light of the Corona here. Um, I'm now going to start sharing my screen. And um, so I'm at Northwestern University. Uh, I also work with a group called FOCUS, uh, which is uh, trying to support uh, uh, eye care education in Haiti. Um, and this is the beginner's guide. Uh, I have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk. <clears throat> and I just <clears throat> want to go through and introduce uh, these speakers. Uh, you may want to unshare me as the highlight so that the uh, group panel shot shows up. Uh, so I'm from Northwestern. And uh, Dr. Venkatesh, uh, who spoke uh, a few minutes ago, uh, is from Pondicherry in India. Uh, Dr. Harapriya uh, is in Chennai uh, for Aravind. Uh, uh, Madhu Shekhar is the uh, Chief of Cataract Surgery in Madurai, their main location. Uh, Jeff Petty uh, is from uh, Moran uh, in Salt Lake City. Uh, Dr. Finkley is at Wills in Philadelphia. Dr. Surendra Basti is at Northwestern with me in Chicago. <clears throat> Dr. Shankar and Dr. Janani are uh, both uh, staff physicians attendings at Aravind in Madurai. Dr. Coram uh, is a world traveler having uh, lived in Saipan, Virginia, but now resides in the Czech Republic. Dr. Avni Shah uh, was at Moran uh, recently and uh, now is in Santa Rosa. Dr. Pawan, Dr. Vivek are both at Aravind 
uh, <clears throat> uh, having been recently both in uh, Pondicherry. Uh, Dr. Kapil uh, is a resident at Wilmer who has recent experience. And Dr. John Davis uh, is our uh, IT guru and SICS uh, surgeon in Cochin, India. So we welcome you all and uh, we can now uh, move uh, for first an introduction by Dr. Uh, John Davis. Then we will move to Dr. Kapil Mishra. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Welcome to the manual small session webinar. First, I'll give you some tips how to make the optimal use of this webinar. So first, let us see. Uh, let me just get my slide ready. So I have no financial disclosures. Let us see that um, those who are able to attend this live, hope, uh, a lot of people are able to attend through Zoom webinar. Those who are not able to do that, uh, and those of so your friends are not able to attend that, there is a YouTube live stream going on at this address. Share this address to them. There's a Facebook live stream going on at this address. And if you miss this live, you can watch it later in the YouTube channel, which is linked to this, and the Facebook page, which is linked to this. Don't worry if you miss it, you can always uh, watch it later. But if you want to watch it live, these are the three options right now. Zoom is full, so those are the other two options. If you are not able to hear um, in Zoom, you can click join audio and you can call in via device audio. Or if you really want to, you can dial in through a phone number if your internet uh, audio is not that great. If you still cannot hear this, check your volume. And if it's still not working, you can leave the Zoom meeting and use the YouTube or Facebook Live instead. To ask questions, uh, we, the panelists, prefer that you ask using the Q&A option on the bottom of your screen. Uh, use the Q&A option to ask questions directly to the panelists. We will get to each question from there. If you want to add any additional points, you can also use the chat option. If you want to have a direct uh, oral question, you want to talk, you can raise your hand. If we have time, we will get to that. To ask questions on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, you can type in questions in the chat boxes. And uh, like you saw the two polls we launched, there will be a few more polls coming in. So let us get on with it. Once more, the YouTube Live is at this particular address. And the Facebook I was at this and let's uh, get on to the webinar. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, first, I invite uh, uh, Dr. Kapil Mishra, who is in uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, Wilmer I Institute, to talk a little bit about uh, evidence. What is the evidence for small incision and why uh, somebody should learn, and also the resources available for an OI surgeon at this point of time. Kapil. Great. Thank you, Dr. Venkatesh, and thank you, Dr. Myers, and everyone else for letting me um, uh, join the seminar. So uh, my name is Kapil Mishra. I, I'm a uh, resident at Wilmer, and I had the pleasure of going to Arvind a couple months ago to learn small incision cataract surgery. And living in a world of FACO, I never actually seen SICS live. And so uh, it's a very, it's a crash course while you're at Arvind. So what was it that I could do beforehand to try and, uh, to try and learn this as best I can? So I have no financial disclosures. I want to just briefly discuss the literature on SICS because I'd heard again and again that it's a high volume, high, out, uh, high output, high, uh, highly effective cataract surgery. But where does that actually sort of come from in the literature? And then just to present some worthwhile resources prior to your first case and, and how you can start sort of winning the game before you're actually in the OR. So there's a lot of literature on uh, SICS, but I wanted to highlight three randomized controlled trials uh, that compared SICS directly with FACO. Uh, one was done at Arvind by Dr. Venkatesh, one was done in Pune at the Desai I Institute, and one was done in Nepal. And then if you looked at visual outcomes for two of the randomized controlled trials, when they compared the two procedures, they showed similar uncorrected visual acuity on post-op day one. Uh, as well as a best corrective visual acuity greater than or equal to 20 or 60 uh, at six weeks. 
And then for Dr. Venkatesh's study, they looked specifically at white cataracts, so sort of mature, uh, uh, complicated cases, and they found no significant differences in uncorrected visual acuity on post-op day one, and pretty much the same finding as the, as the other two uh, randomized control trials. And then interestingly, the SICS uh, cases had less corneal edema, which was statistically significant on post-op day one. And so when we think about astigmatism in SICS, it, there's a lot of factors that are at play. Uh, the length of the incision, how far it is from the limbus, whether it's superior or temporal, uh, the shape of the incision. And, and so you would think that a, a larger incision would lead to more astigmatism. But when actually looking at the numbers in these trials, uh, they weren't significantly different compared to uh, FACO. Uh, and at six months, that kind of carried forward where the amount of astigmatism in SICS was not as much as you would expect. And then if you consider cataract surgery as a form of glaucoma surgery, in terms of IOP reduction, uh, there was a thought that FACO ultrasonic energy uh, would affect the trabecular mesh hook, and that this would be one of the contributions of IOP reduction. But actually, SICS in this randomized control trial, again, by Dr. Venka, they showed uh, no difference between the two procedures in terms of IOP reduction. In terms of complications, posterior capsule rupture, same thing, no significant difference between the two uh, surgeries. And in overall complication rate, Dr. Haripriya did a really nice retrospective series uh, in which they saw in th thousands and thousands of procedures between the two, the complication rates were really low for both, 1.01% uh, for SICS and 1.11% for FACO. And then if you tease apart those numbers a little bit, uh, we're able to see kind of who's operating and what their uh, complication rates are. And so this tells a little bit about the learning curve of SICS that uh, and SICS for trainees, it was about 1.46% uh, of complications versus 4.8% with FACO. So having seen all of this data, uh, I was reassured that you know, I can perhaps learn this uh, in a couple of weeks, although I don't want to uh, downplay sort of the complexity of the case. And so there are a lot of resources that are available in terms of uh, trying to really master this beforehand. The first one I wanted to just briefly mention is the one that was actually written by Arvind. Um, eye hospital and it's uh, available on the Global Side Alliance website for free or through Apple Books and it's a very comprehensive 184 pages of all the difficult situations you might uh, encounter. Now this webinar that we're having for two hours is we'll cover you know sort of most of these things but right before your first case if you want to glance at these. Uh, the BCSC also has a nice chapter by Dr. Venkatesh and Dr. Prajna. Um, and then the Orbis CyberSight course has about 12 hours of free footage of preoperative evaluation, um, the surgery itself, and, and postoperative care. And then one of my favorite uh, resources is OroTube, which many of you might be watching this on the uh, Arvind Pondicherry YouTube channel. Uh, but this, this channel is kind of uh, a comprehensive resource for all of ophthalmology under the sun. Uh, but they have a really nice uh, seminar. Um, series for SICS that Dr. Bhavan will get into that has really well laid out animations and it was sort of my lifeline in between cases. And then finally, I cannot stress enough wet lab. I know it seems like a broken record for everyone to always talk about the importance of wet lab, but uh, in terms of uh, FACO versus SICS, there are some similarities as you, as you can imagine and you'll learn about in terms of the, the uh, capsule rexis and, and INA and all of that, but the scleral tunnel is, is pretty unique. And pig eyes uh, versus human eyes, all of these can be sort of utilized uh, with an instructor, an instructor that has SIC ex experience to kind of join you and then make sure you get the tunnel right. Because I would recommend to get the tunnel right before your first case, because it's just so crucial uh, to be able to have a good tunnel before, uh, before proceeding with the rest of the case. So just a brief overview to, to conclude, it, it, the literature shows that it's a safe, a very effective, high volume uh, cataract surgery with great outcomes, and it can be learned by a beginning surgeon. Um, and they're just abundance of resources that exist for us uh, and are valuable to, to see prior to your first case. And then definitely the one tip I'd give, and you'll hear tons of tips throughout the seminar, is to master the scleral tunnel before your first case. And then just, just want to acknowledge those uh, who uh, guided me at Arvind and, and for this talk. Thanks. Thank you, Kapil. Uh, I think we'll, we'll take a couple of uh, polling questions now before we go to the next talk by Avnisha.
Sorry, we can check. So this question is, which step is uh, the most challenging for you? Dr. Venkatesh, I think the, uh, mm. the people on the streams aren't able to see the polling questions. Uh, and if they're not me, perhaps uh, Dr. Myers can get started. OK. Okay, yeah. Welcome, uh, Dr. Myers. Uh, Myers will be uh, discussing about uh, the basic steps in doing small incision cataract surgery. Uh, hello again. Uh, so, just getting back into this. Uh, when you start your SICS training, uh, it's best to start with the easy cases, and at Aravind, what they did was started us with immature lenses, ones where there was some red reflex, usually not a very good one. Uh, and the main reason for this is that you can see the adequacy of the posterior capsule. You can usually tell in these cases if there's a, a trauma situation in advance, and they can typically uh, rule out patients that will be difficult for you uh, prior to uh, assigning the case to somebody very uh, novice. Uh, the large uh, pupil is essential in uh, small incision cataract surgery far more uh, than it is in FACO. And uh, you need to get a six and a half to seven millimeter uh, rexus, which requires a pupil of that size. So you have a number of reasons uh, to want a big pupil. And if necessary, you do what is necessary to make the pupil big enough to accomplish all the remaining steps. Uh, you want to have a cooperative patient, uh, usually someone, at least in India, that is under 60 years old. Uh, they need to be able to lie down for a long time because you're a beginner and it's going to take you longer. You'll have a lot of uh, tentative uh, attempts at steps before you become fluid and eliminate the dead time. Uh, there shouldn't be any uh, systemic contraindications. Uh, I don't personally think adrenaline intraoperatively given uh, intraocularly is going to be a problem, uh, but if they have asthma and are wheezing and have trouble lying down, you don't want to be doing your first case on that patient. And obviously if a patient has a severe uh, lack of vision in one eye, you don't want to be operating on their good eye, it should go to somebody senior. Uh, so 
the opposite of that is that you want a relatively prominent eye, you want a normal or clear cornea, uh, a normal anterior chamber depth, so you have room to work, uh, a well dilated pupil, ideally eight millimeters, seven is probably adequate. Smaller than that, you have to decide what you're going to do in terms of making the pupil bigger. Um, and uh, you want the zonules to be intact. You don't want phacodenesis. You want a relatively soft cataract. At Aravind, I would say their NS scale is not one to four, but one to eight. Uh, so we did three, uh, one to three on their scale or one to two on the US. I'm saying one to three on the US scale and one to two on their scale. And a red reflex is helpful, although uh, you can stain the capsule uh, for a better uh, view of the capsule. Uh, avoid deep sockets, high myopes, uh, people with uh, coexisting ocular disease, uh, very dense uh, cataracts, intumescent cataracts. Uh, those are ones with increased uh, anterior capsular curvature um, and uh, pseudo exfoliation and small pupils. Uh, there are some uh, preoperative triage uh, measurements that are taken uh, that they allow the senior doctors at Aravin to help you uh, to uh, pick the appropriate cases. Uh, so if the anterior chamber depth is less than two and a half millimeters, the lens thickness greater than five, uh, then it's probably a good idea to pass that to a more senior doctor. Uh, the uh, senior nurse at uh, uh, Aravind triages the cases to the learning surgeons based on the surgeon's experience. Uh, there are a number of instruments used in M6 surgery. Uh, most of them are ones you're familiar with. Uh, the two that you might not be would be the Simcoe needle, which is soldered together uh, with two barrels coming out. And uh, the other is uh, the irrigating vectus, which goes on a saline syringe. Uh, these others are all instruments you're probably used to, with the exception of the crescent knife, which allows uh, for an easier scleral tunnel. Uh, the nurse will prepare a few things in advance. The, uh, we'll get into that later. Um, and then adrenaline is mixed up uh, to a very dilute uh, level. Uh, and uh, is often used on the early cases to maximize the pupil size and to keep it from coming down as quickly. Uh, any touch of the iris is going to cause problems for you. The Aura tube series has already been discussed. Uh, they use subtenons anesthesia. There's a great uh, video on the uh, Pondicherry Aura tube uh, site. Uh, I recommend everybody look at that. This is a great alternative uh, for uh, direct visualization of placing uh, posterior anesthesia uh, rather than using a retrobulbar or parabulbar block. It incorporates a large cannula inserted around the globe past the equator slightly uh, with three cc's given. Uh, so now we're into the real steps of the procedure. Uh, the opening should be about three o'clock hours centered on the superior rectus suture. You make a snip on the right side, dissect the conjunctiva and tenons uh, radial to the limbus, and then place the tips in, dissect it across, snip toward the left side, and make a little turn to uh, uh, do a slight relaxing incision. Uh, bipolar cautery is used uh, for better visualization. Uh, advanced uh, sometimes don't do any uh, bipolar at all. And the assistant can irrigate with a uh, cannula from a distance and keep the uh, area clear for the bipolar cautery. Uh, you want at least a six millimeter incision. And I would recommend at the beginning, a seven millimeter incision is uh, preferable. Start two millimeters back. Uh, there'll be some videos and uh, examples later on. Uh, you can arc with the tip of the 15 blade uh, it's made lightly so that you're only uh, going in 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters into the sclera, and you're holding it lightly like a, pan a pencil. 
Uh, you want to then underline the, the lip of the incision slightly, uh, slight downward uh, movement uh, uh, undermining that lip. Uh, you can wiggle, once you get undermined to the approximate 0.3 millimeter depth, you can advance in the sclera to the inflection point where the increased curvature of the cornea begins, and then drop the heel, bring the tip upward a bit, and enter into the cornea approximately 1.5 millimeters. Uh, this uh, just shows uh, things that can go wrong in the incision. Uh, this is the ideal incision. Others will be talking about premature entry where you get the iris root there. And um, buttonholing is when you come back out the anterior lip and you can cut all the way through the sclera. If you get in the ciliary body, that's trouble. Uh, but if you find that you can see the ciliary body through your incision, uh, that's called scleral disinsertion. Uh, what you might want to do when you start is to measure the dimensions of the blades you'll be using, look with a regular microscope, so that you can use that as a, a guide to how long your incisions are. Uh, you can mark three points uh, with a uh, cap, um, caliper uh, initially, or you can mark it with just little nicks in the sclera to make sure that you follow that uh, curvature. Uh, you'll go bigger for very dense brown-black uh, cataracts. We've talked a little bit about the uh, undermining. The indications for moving temporally, uh, if you're advanced enough, is against the rule of stigmatism. That will be the most common reason. Uh, but if the limbus is abnormal in that region, the cornea is extra thin, the sclera is thin, then you might have to move to a, a better location. The differences are that a temporal incision is not just automatically covered by the conjunctiva. It's essential that it be uh, completely covered. Uh, you can start a little closer to the limbus and go more into the cornea uh, because of the relatively short uh, limbal region temporally. Uh, you're going to make a paracentesis uh, for your uh, dominant uh, hand side. Uh, you can go a little bit beyond 90 degrees and that will aid in removing subincisional uh, cortex later on. Uh, it can be made in a number of different fashions, either using the 15 degree blade fully inserted or 2.2 not quite uh, inserted um, as a symmetric keratome. Uh, and you want to uh, not push down as you're exiting with the blade or the anterior chamber will collapse and you may accidentally cut the anterior capsule. Uh, you can use this uh, later on for OVD placement, uh, the capsulorexis with uh, either a cystotome or a uh, small incision type utrata. <clears throat> and uh, for removal of most of the cortex as the chamber stays better. As you get to the, uh, you're going to now bring the keratome into your completed uh, tunnel. And you wanna drop back approximately a quarter millimeter from the furthest extent to make sure that when you uh, cut through decimase and endothelium that you are in previously uh, tunneled cornea and not uh, fresh cornea to provide a better uh, internal lip. <clears throat> You'll make a small incision internally for the rexus or use your side port, particularly if there's posterior pressure uh, shallowing the anterior chamber. Uh, usually the internal entry is going to be eight to 10 millimeters. You're gonna be cutting on the instroke and you wanna stay parallel to the iris uh, after wiggling the tip in for the first part. And at the end, you're going to turn the tip outward uh, to make sure the inner lip is uh, fully open. Uh, a six plus millimeter rexus is essential. Uh, you'll do the subincisional portion uh, first to avoid the flap floating out through the incision. You need to lift up on the external lip, uh, on the incisional lip in your tunnel uh, to avoid uh, outflow of the OVD. 
uh, typically in these uh, uh, less developed places and at Aravin because it's the least expensive OVD, these are highly uh, fluid, uh, low viscosity. So they tend to come out very easily and you need to be willing to refill, but don't overfill uh, when your flap is anywhere near the incision uh, by placing it in the enter chamber, it will just cause the uh, capsule to flow outward. Uh, if you make the incision just slightly larger on your dominant hand side, the um, or superiorly, uh, the nucleus will pop up in that region preferentially and be a little easier to get it up out of the capsular bag uh, following that. If you can't get the rexus flap to flip over <clears throat> uh, after making the linear cut, you can make a little back cut right near the center forming a very tiny uh, bottom part of the L. And then the flap will flip because you've uh, untethered it <clears throat> and create a new uh, pivot point. So uh, I'm gonna avoid these details. You can come back and watch this later. Uh, in terms of getting the rexus started. If you can't get a good rexus, it's fine to make a can opener uh, <clears throat> to complete the rexus um, and will allow more easy exit of the nucleus from the capsular bag. Uh, hydrodissection uh, is used, except uh, hydrodelineation is used if you want to make a smaller nucleus, uh, and no hydrodissection should be used. Uh, if it's a posterior polar or dense cataract where you can't see the posterior capsule to avoid capsular blowout. <coughs> uh, and then you want to get either hydro or visco under the nucleus, injecting all the time uh, to push up on the nucleus and into the anterior chamber uh, with the uh, visco approach. Uh, you need to have a 6.5 millimeter uh, diameter, at least one diameter. And then uh, sometimes it's easy enough to flip the nucleus into the anterior chamber by plus pressing down on the nucleus that's still in the bag uh, with a gentle but constant uh, motion, and that will sweep the nucleus up and around. Uh, another technique, which is probably the most commonly used one, is called the wheeling technique. Uh, particularly for somewhat denser nuclei. Um, and there uh, you will hook using the Sinsky hook at the equator of the lens um, and pull it toward the center, then up and start to rotate it up into the anterior chamber. You can rotate in either direction. Uh, if the iris uh, diameter is too small, uh, pupil not large enough, Adrenaline can uh, be used or stretching the iris or iris hooks, or one can even cut the uh, superior, superior iris sphincter or make small cuts uh, in the inferior three uh, quadrants. You can also use a second hand to slightly extend a intact rexus. and use a two-handed technique to keep the part of the nucleus up that has already rotated out. Expression is done by pressing on the posterior lip of the incision early, which gets the nucleus to come into the incision. Uh, you use the irrigating vectus, but not irrigating at that point. Uh, once it's engaged, then you pull up on the incision and down <coughs> on the incision with the vectus begin irrigation and draw the lens out following the path of your tunnel. Uh, the nucleus fits into the concavity of the vectus. And again, all three steps are done almost simultaneously with irrigation minimally later. Uh, if the nucleus fractures, you can reposition the second part of the nucleus uh, with viscoelastic and then have it extracted a second time. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, washing the epinucleus is done by pressing on the posterior lip of the incision while irrigating into the anterior chamber. Um, and that usually will flush out with the downward pressure. Uh, cortex, you'll remove first uh, the subparacentesis with the irrigating, uh, with the Simcoe cannula. Um, using a uh, uh, circumferential motion to acquire the cortex, try not to touch the posterior capsule as these Simcoe needles tend to have little burrs because of the welding technique or damage from long use. You can power wash the posterior capsule with a stream of uh, saline. Generally saline, uh, it, actually Ringer's lactate is typically used because it's much less expensive than balanced salt solution. For the IOL insertion, you're gonna fill the anterior chamber. Uh, generally a three-piece uh, 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 PMMA, one-piece PMMA is the least expensive. If the rectus is intact, that's usually what's used. If not, then uh, a, a three-piece lens uh, is better suited for this. Uh, and it's placed into the eye. You can use your second hand to hold the uh, near the incision so that you can uh, keep the IOL from coming out. And then you will dial it in with the Sinsky or a similar type hook. <coughs> and then you should confirm bag placement uh, by uh, pushing outward on the iris to confirm with the Kuglin hook. Uh, we'll skip this uh, for later talks. Uh, the final step is to wash the OVD out of the eye through the main incision uh, by pressing down on the posterior lip and irrigating. Uh, then go to the side port to remove the last uh, part and to uh, get the incision to seal. Uh, you have to seal your paracentesis. It's key to uh, seal it in the mid part of the paracentesis and not uh, in the corners to avoid a fish mouthing of the wound. Uh, at Aravind, they teach uh, to put the pressure where it's much firmer than I'm used to doing. Uh, and uh, they would know by now if that wasn't safe uh, with the number of cases they do. Um, and then uh, you can uh, sweep the cornea to get a sense of the firmness. And if you can't get the paracentesis to seal, you can blow a stream with a large bore cannula of the ringer's lactate and a little bit will go in the eye and some will go into the stroma and it seems to always work unless there's a wound leak through your main incision. Rearrange the conjunctiva to its original position, use bipolar coaptation uh, using uh, the coaptation forceps. And then the very last step is to inject moxifloxacin into the anterior chamber uh, via the external uh, paracentesis to avoid loss of seal, uh, you wanna be minimally into the incision and you do not wanna press down. Um, I'm gonna skip the video because there'll be other uh, people showing video. And if you wanna come back to this uh, by checking to the link, uh, you can put uh, images to the words I tried to paint for you. Thank you. Thank you, Myers. Uh, it was an excellent introduction to the basic steps. Uh, now we'll go to the next talk. I think it's uh, there are a lot of beginners here. We see from the polling, uh, people who are going to learn this technique in the near future once all the uh, pandemic settles down. So we have uh, Avni Shah, who was an international fellow at uh, Moran Ice Center. She has done a lot of international work uh, and also with small incisions. She's got a very good experience in not only learning but also teaching. So she's going to talk to us about some of the tips for beginners. Thank you, Dr. Venkatesh, Dr. Myers. Um, I'm Avni. I was the uh, Global Ophthalmology Fellow at the Moran Eye Center in Utah last year. Um, and now I'm in private practice in Santa Rosa, California. Uh, very, very um, honored to be on this panel with some extremely accomplished and skilled surgeons. And a special shout out to Dr. Venkatesh and Dr. Vivekanan then who are both here who were my M6 teachers. So uh, I wanted to um, kind of just sort of hone in on what the most important things were for me when I was learning uh, this surgery, kind of going back to those people 
uh, from the polls, looks like there's a, over half of the people watching have never done this surgery or are in the very beginning stages. And the key points and key takeaways um, of what to focus on as a beginner. So, um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, so pearls when it comes to steps. So um, the tunnel is gonna be your most important thing here. Um, and you'll hear this many, many times throughout the talk, but basically if you have a strong solid tunnel, basically 80% of your surgery is done. Um, yes, there are other parts of the surgery that may be complex, but if you have a good tunnel, if you've taken the time to make sure that your wound construction is good, as long as you're gentle in the eye and you're patient, you can get through almost any case. Um, and so it's really, really important when you're starting out to take the time and do that. I know it's tempting when you watch Dr. Hari Priya, um, who goes really, really fast and makes her tunnel in about 30 seconds to try and do it fast and look that good. But uh, really take the time, be OCD, uh, and that includes using a new blade. Don't use a dull blade when you're learning. Make sure you've got good globe fixation. So that could mean a superior rectus suture. Uh, you want good exposure of the area and take your time. And, and you'll see in some of the videos uh, people will point out in, in some of the other talks that the, the area of the section of the wound, there's typically um, enough space that you can divide it into three sections. And so when you're starting out and making your tunnel, if you don't have good depth in one third of the section, then move to a different third and find a good plane there and go across. Don't kind of just trudge forward with a tunnel that isn't gonna be strong. You really wanna focus on that and, and make that a priority. Um, this is um, especially important for people that are used to phaco surgery. Um, we have small incisions that are a little more forgiving if there's pressure that you put on your wound. When you have a large incision in this surgery and you put posterior pressure on the wound, you immediately will lose your anterior chamber. So you have to get really good at using the, uh, the wound as a fulcrum and pivoting your instruments downwards instead of pressing downwards in order to maintain your anterior chamber throughout the case. Um, this is something that I thought is, is pretty important. So, you know, there's many different ways to do a capsulotomy. You'll see that throughout this course. Um, sometimes people start a capsulorexis and then it runs out in one place and you have to finish with a can opener. If you have one area of your capsulotomy that you think is weaker than the rest of it, uh, maybe don't do a forceful hydro prolapse in this case. This might be a good case to use the Sinsky hook and hook the lens out of the bag or do a bimanual prolapse, which you'll see some videos of later on in the course. Uh, but if you, if you do that forceful hydro prolapse, you may blow that area out and cause a PC tear. Uh, really, really important, uh, don't struggle to get the nucleus up out of the capsule or out of the eye. So if your capsulorexis is a little too small and your nucleus just won't come out, if you're struggling with it, you might get a zonular dialysis or some other issue. So make a few relaxing cuts in the capsulorexis. I know for phaco surgeons, that's a little bit um, scary to do, but if you make three or four cuts sort of evenly spaced around, I've never seen that actually lead to a posterior capsular tear and the nucleus comes out a lot more easily. Um, it can also get stuck in the sulcus. It can come out of the bag and then sit behind the iris. So if you know at the beginning of the case that your iris isn't gonna be large enough, make a couple of sphincter cuts as well, sphincterotomies, or you can use iris hooks. Um, and then enlarge the wound. I'll show a video of what happens when you try and pull the nucleus out through a tunnel that's too narrow. Uh, and you definitely don't want that. Um, cortex removal, so the Simcoe uh, for cortex removal is something new for a lot of people. Um, and there are two places you can put the Simcoe in to remove cortex, one is through the main wound and the other is through the side port. I would say as much as you can, try and do most of the cortex removal through the side port. It maintains your anterior chamber and your depth a lot better, uh, but you may have to change your mag and your focus a little bit to be able to do it. And this may be the first time in the case that you're actually changing the focus. And so pay attention to that at this step. And when you're dialing the intraocular lens into the bag, um, again, you're doing this through the main wound. Again, you may be putting some pressure on the main wound. You may lose your anterior chamber. So every maneuver you make, 
add more viscoelastic into the eye. This is something that Dr. Vivekanan then used to always tell me, um, you know, it may take a few maneuvers to really get the all both haptics and the optic into the bag. And each time you come out and you're about to go back in, put more viscoelastic in the eye. If you lose viscoelastic and the haptic drags along the bag, you can easily get a PC tear when otherwise the case has gone well. This is a, a visual schematic that I think is really helpful for beginners uh, making their scleral tunnel. This was created by John Welling. Um, and basically this shows how the, the, the crescent blade should look as you're tunneling forward. You should be able to see it, but it should have some translucency like in this top picture. Um, down at the bottom left here, you'll see that the crescent blade is quite visible and you see this bunching of tissue right in front of the crescent blade. If you're seeing that, that means that you're too superficial and you're probably gonna buttonhole through here. Um, likewise, if your crescent blade completely disappears behind sclera as you're tunneling forward, you're probably too deep and you're about to have a premature entry right at the limbus there. So those are some things to watch out for. Again, you can divide the, um, the section into, into three. As someone starting, I would probably start on the side and once you have good depth, kind of take that over all the way. If you start in the middle, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, but if you, if you see that it's too thin in one area, start in a different area, find a good plane, find a good depth and take that over. A couple of videos here, I'm gonna show some wound issues first. So, um, Buttonhole, uh, this again can happen if you're too superficial. So you'll see um, in this case, um, the buttonhole was created right there. So they're finding another area, they're going a little bit deeper and um, getting through right there. Taking it across, making that nice plane underneath the buttonhole. And that's actually a totally fine situation to be in. That buttonhole will not communicate with the eye and you can go through your case normally. But recognizing that and uh, going under creating a new plane is important. Premature entry. So here uh, the surgeon does not uh, change the angle of the crescent blade when they're going in. So they go right in at the limbus. They don't recognize that. They extend the entire incision and then they have trouble during surgery. You can see the rexus is difficult because they're losing uh, all the viscoelastic through this very short wound that they have um, when they try to hydroprolapse here because the wound is very short, other intraocular contents will come out of the eye. So here the iris is coming out. Um, and then once you have that, you're basically struggling with that through the entire case. And so you'll see that, try and struggle with that, trying to remove the lens. Very difficult because the iris wants to come out as well. And they're trying again. The iris is trying to come out again, has to be pushed back. When you're doing IA, if you're doing it from the wound, it's very difficult. So these are all issues that you'll see um, if you have a premature entry and you can see how just one issue with the tunnel makes the entire case much, much more difficult than it could have been. And so the way they handle um, cortex removal here is actually bipolar without using the main wound and that works well in this scenario. And uh, this is a case of a premature entry that was recognized very early. So they haven't even done a capsulorexis yet and already just injecting viscoelastic, the iris comes out. So this is basically a wound that's not going to be useful. It's gonna create a lot of problems. And this is what I might recommend doing if you notice this early on in the case. Uh, you can just amputate the iris that's come out um, and suture the wound. and then make a brand new wound. In this case, uh, they had a superior wound that they sutured and so they're gonna make a temporal wound. Um, and Dr. Myers gave us a great um, breakdown of the differences between a superior and a temporal wound. Temporal wound is a little more challenging, but, um, but it's the same concept really and 
I've done this a couple of times when I felt the superior wound wasn't really going to be adequate for the case. Like I said, having a good wound is, is most of the case. So it's really worth it to assess whether your wound is going to be good. And they did the whole case through a temporal wound here and went well. Um, and so here we have a tunnel that's too small. Sorry, one sec. So this is showing um, a tunnel that is too narrow for the, um, the size of the lens being removed. And so it's really important to make sure that the width of the tunnel is going to be adequate for the size of the nucleus. Some soft cataracts can come out through a smaller tunnel, but if you have any significant density to the nucleus, then you're going to need a larger tunnel to be able to accommodate that lens coming out. And so the most important thing really is if you think your tunnel may be too small, prolapse the nucleus into the anterior chamber and then assess, is the width of my nucleus gonna come out through the width of my tunnel? And here you can see there's a huge discrepancy between how large the nucleus is and how wide the tunnel is. You can see there's struggling trying to get the nucleus out. At this point, you really should go in and enlarge the nucleus, but they're continuing to try. Some iris was incarcerated in the wound and you can see they've caused a huge iridodialysis um, and that's not nice. So, you know, if you, if you notice that the tunnel is not large enough for the nucleus, the best thing to do is to go in and enlarge that wound at that point. So here, you know, we're trying to get the nucleus out. And this is, again, don't struggle. If you feel like the nucleus is not coming out and you feel like it may be a tunnel size issue, just go in with your keratome. This is very easy to do once you already have your tunnel created and just enlarge it on either side, make sure you enlarge those side pockets as well. And you can see the nucleus now comes out with no problem. So um, in terms of approach to learning, you'll see through these talks that there are many, many different ways to do some of these steps. There's different ways to do a capsulotomy. There are different ways to prolapse the lens, to deliver the lens. Um, as a new learner, is it important to learn all of these techniques or should you consistently just practice one technique? I think the answer to that depends on how you plan to use these new skills. So if you want to go work in many different varied low resource settings, then yeah, it might be good to learn a bunch of different techniques because you don't know what instruments, what tools you're going to have in all of those different settings. You don't know what types of cataracts you're going to encounter and what techniques you're going to need to know. I think if you're planning to use this just in your practice at home to deal with certain really difficult cataracts, it's probably better to consistently practice one technique, feel really comfortable with that technique. So when it comes time to do a planned SICS or a conversion, you feel like you've, um, you're really comfortable with that one technique. Hey guys, I know Kapil mentioned um, using pig eyes in the wet lab. It's important to understand what the pig eyes can do for you and what the limitations are in terms of learning the surgery. So um, pig eyes are great for practicing with the crescent blade if you're not used to using that instrument, feeling how those movements feel in the sclera, um, practicing adjusting your tunnel depth. So practicing being shallow and then kind of going deeper and vice versa. And also practicing changing the angle of your crescent blade when you go from the sclera to the cornea. Um, I would say because they're larger and the sclera is thicker compared to human eyes, they're really not good for those visual cues. And so using some of those schematics to see uh, how your crescent blade should look would be a little bit more helpful than using a pig eye for that. Mentorship, you'll hear it uh, many times. It's really, really important to do your first few cases with someone who's experienced in this technique and can guide you through, whether that be at a course run by C International, the Academy, ASCRS, or even going to Aravind or Tilganga or one of these other places where um, you can do a course in SICS. 
Um, alternatively, if you have someone in your community that is comfortable with this technique, have them come and, and mentor you on a few of your first cases, even in the wet lab. Um, it's really, really helpful to be guided by someone who knows what they're doing. Most important thing I think is your first few cases should be planned. Don't just say, oh, I'll try this for the first time when I'm in a situation where I need to convert. A lot of issues with doing that. Um, if you're planning the case, then you'll be sure you're in the right mindset for this surgery. You have all the right tools, your staff's prepared, um, you're all set up for it and you can review the technique right before you go in and do the case. It's gonna feel a lot better. When you're converting, you're, you're kind of nervous, things are already going wrong. You're not really set up um, to be successful in this as you're learning. So really, really important to, to plan. Um, that's all I have. So thanks and look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Avni. No, that was really very useful. No, these are some of the practical difficulties no, when you uh, encounter, when you start doing this. So next we'll have uh, uh, one of my colleagues and an excellent small incision surgeon, Dr. Pawan, uh, who has also made that uh, AM6 uh, series in Autotube, which I would highly recommend each one of you to watch before starting your uh, small incision. Uh, so he'll be talking to us how to do this technique safely. You know, some of the important tips and tricks he'll share. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, am I audible clearly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So um, Dr. Avni and Dr. Mayes have beautifully described the difficulties and the challenges and the precautions to be taken as a for a beginner surgeon uh, in starting M6. So I'm going to talk about a few tips and uh, tricks for making the uh, routine SCCS more safer. So, so why do we need these small trips and tricks? So even though the basic steps remains the same, it's, it includes the same tunneling, then excess nucleus extraction, IOL implantation, but still, if you take, if you ask every surgeon, every surgeon has thousand ways of doing the same surgery. So what happens is this minor modifications can greatly alter the outcome of the surgery. And um, I'm going to talk about certain few common problems, which I usually encounter with the beginners when I'm training them. And I'll try to give some tips to rectify it. And I also suggest some tricks to overcome them. So when you take um, the most challenging steps for a beginner surgeon, includes the first thing is always a sclerocorneal tunnel as uh, both the army and uh, Myers highlighted it. Then comes the capsular excess. Even though the FACO surgeons are comfortable in doing capsular excess, most of them end up doing a small excess in FACO. But in SSCS, we need a little larger excess. And the prolapsing of the nucleus is a little difficult because in FACO, we don't usually prolapse the nucleus, but SSCS, we have to prolapse and take it out. And then finally, the eye wall implantation because the FACO surgeon usually do a foldable eye wall implantation. What we do in SSCS is a rigid eye wall implantation. So there, there will be some challenges to implant this eye wall. The first thing is always, uh, do a proper conjunctival peritomy. So usually what uh, the beginners land up doing is uh, they try to make a larger uh, conjunctival peritomy when compared to the wound. So what usually happens is when they make a larger uh, conjunctival peritomy, they'll have a very poor hole during surgery. They're not able to fix the eye. Then they'll have a problem starting with the tunnel, rexis, everything. And there is also difficulty in approximation of flap, uh, flap ends at the end of the surgery. So usually try to make uh, as small as possible are just a little bigger than the uh, planned incision. So my tips is like when you start, you just hold the conjunctiva a little bit away from the limbus and then give a small vertical nick. Once you give a small vertical nick, close both the blades and just, just go inside. Once you are inside, then start dissecting it. Don't cut it and then uh, slowly cut along the limbus. Once the adequate length is reached, make sure that you don't go uh, parallel to the limbus, just come away a little away from the limbus so that you, you get a curved end at this part so that that will not, that will not have a leading edge. So you'll have a proper hold to uh, uh, fixate the globe. The second part is the sclerocorneal tunneling as uh, they have highlighted certain complications like button hole and uh, uh, pre premature entry can be easily avoided. If you follow a thumb rule, it says if you take this as a crescent and it has a heel. So when we are in the sclera, we have to make sure that the heel goes up. And when you are in the cornea, the heel goes down. So when you diagrammatically represent it, 
So when you're starting the incision and then dissecting the sclera, make sure that the heel is up. It is up and it goes pal in, into the sclera. So once you reach the limbus, the cornea is taking a curved shape here. So you, if you go straight, then you land up in premature entry. And if you don't keep the heel uh, up, if you keep the heel down, then you may come out of the sclera, come out of the cornea. So as soon as you reach the limbus, make sure that you down the heel so that you enter into the cornea in a proper plane. So the mnemonic is heel down when in cornea and heel up when you are in the sclera. Then the third most common uh, uh, mistake what the beginners do is they don't consider the side pockets in a sclerocorneal tunnel. I'll tell you what the side pocket is. So usually they dissect this scleral part and they'll enter the cornea and they'll dissect the cornea part also. So what they forget is they forget to dissect the uh, sclerocorneal junction at the ends. So this is where the pocket is formed. So what happens is instead of making a, a trapezoid shaped tunnel, they land up in making a bottleneck shaped tunnel. So what happens is they dissect the cornea, dissect the sclera, but they don't dissect the limbus and the adjacent part of it. So what happens is this acts like a bottleneck and when you try to deliver the nucleus, so the nucleus will come and get stuck at the bottleneck. So they'll try to keep on, uh, take it out, take it out, but they land up in iris prolapse or PCR as Ami pointed out. So what we have to do is once your corneal dissection is done, make sure that you go at the end, just start creating a side pocket on both the sides. So this will uh, cause a little bit widening of the tunnel. So that makes the nucleus delivery easier. So when doing capsular excess, um, whatever may be the size of the capsular excess, what first thing what you have to take into note is that in our left hand, which is our non-dominant hand, should not compress the globe too much. So what happens when you compress the globe too much? In a SACS, the wound is larger. That is going to cause the leakage of the visco from the wound. So that causes the AC to become shallow. Once AC becomes shallow, the vitreous will start pushing the lens anteriorly and the uh, curvature of the anterior lens becomes more. So that becomes more curved. So this leads to excess extension. So the idea is not to compress the globe in your non-dominant hand, just to support it. So whenever we are injecting through the side port, we have to make sure that the cannula is inside the anterior chamber when we are injecting it. So most of the time what happens is just in the cornea, we think that anyway the opening is there, the fluid can go inside. So we should not uh, be in the wound when we are injecting the visco or any fluid. So once we, once we are in the wound and we start injecting, the DM can easily get detached. So we have to make sure that we have to enter the anterior chamber, then only dissect, then only inject. So this video shows the surgeon made a side port, but if you carefully see, is is still at the wound only. So what happens is, so this is a easily it will cause DM detachment and the DM may be shallow in the beginning, but once the surgery goes on, it may you may land up in doing a DM detachment at a later part. So then the whole thing will complicate the surgery. The next step is the nucleus prolapse. So uh, as all of us know, the diameter of the nucleus is nine millimeter and the thickness is about four to five millimeter. So take out the nucleus from the excess, we need at least 5.5 to six millimeter minimum in an SACS. So only when we have this amount of uh, excess size, then only we'll be able to take out nine millimeter diameter nucleus out of this. So if the excess becomes small, so when we keep on trying to prolapse the nucleus to this small uh, uh, rexis, it keeps on causing more stress on the zonules and the back. So that in, the, in, uh, that in turn results in zonular dialysis or it can cause sometimes nucleus drop also. So we have to be extremely careful to identify the rexis size and then take measures as Avni clearly mentioned, that we, we can give a multiple relaxation cut or we can even do a double rexis. The next step is to visualize the vectus edge under the nucleus. This is a very important step. So we think that once the cataract density is more, so we, the, we feel that vectus which is going under the nucleus is mostly not visible, but that is not the truth. Vectus will still be visible even whatever may be the grade of the cataract. So if you see various scenarios where a mature cataract or a brown cataract, still we will be able to make out the edge of the vectus under the nucleus. So what if you are not seeing the uh, vectus margin under the nucleus, that means vectus is under the inferior iris. So is, the ideally it has to be under the nucleus but if we don't visualize, that means it has gone behind the iris. And if you try to prolapse the nucleus, it will easily land up in causing inferior dialysis. And as all of us know that inferior dialysis is the most uh, dreadful complication to manage. 
the next point is should not depress the lower lip of the wound during irrigation aspiration so in phaco emulsification the wound is smaller so even if you lightly manure the wound still the ac will maintain but in case of ssas is not like that because it's a very big wound once you start depressing the lo uh, lower lip of the wound the wound keeps on opening and leading to leakage and shallowing of the anterior chamber so when you introduce the simco if you are depressing it so what happens is the fluid will come and only wound is open so it will easily go get out so ac will keep on shallowing so it's very difficult to take out the cortex so instead of it what we have to do is we have to gently lift the upper lip so that whatever the fluid comes it will come and it will hit the lower lip and the lower lip will go up so that causes closure of the wound and it will maintain the anterior chamber so next is in cortex wash so i usually take it call it as an elephant rule where when we have a cortex we we try to hold a smaller part of a smaller fiber and keep on trying to pull it so what happens is if we take an elephant we cannot pull the elephant by just holding his tail because so it's so heavy you will keep missing the grip so what we have to do is we have to hold a bigger part that is trunk only when you catch the trunk and try to pull the elephant elephant will easily come out so the same thing applies for the cortex also instead of holding this fiber instead of holding the tail go hold a bigger part the trunk and just try to pull it and the cortex will easily come out so next point is when you are washing the cortex every cortical uh, sheet or a cortical fiber will have two parts one is the anterior part and the posterior part so we have to make sure that we catch hold the anterior part and then pull the cortex so this is the ideal way just go just below the uh, anterior capsule just hold the cortex and just drag it even the posterior part will easily come out what if you don't hold the anterior and try to catch the posterior so instead of catching the posterior cortex most of the time we land up touching the pc or holding the pc so we try to aspirate it will easily cause pc tear so we have to make sure that we have to pull the anterior lip of the cortical fiber than the posterior part the last point is placing a rigid eye wall um, in a bag uh, usually most of us if the pupil is very well dilated it is easy we can just tilt the eye wall and just directly place it in the bag sometimes placing the eye wall directly in the bag is a little difficult it may be due to small pupils so in this we can i can suggest the three simple steps which can help us implanting the eye wall easily into the bag the first step is place the eye wall into the anterior chamber just above the iris the haptics and uh, both the haptics oriented at 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock once it is in the anterior chamber it will be seen like this so what you have to do is next take the sinski hold the distal dialing hole drag the eye wall towards the center so this will uh, give some gap once that is done what you have to do is you have to dip the eye wall down so dip it below the iris and recess margin and then push it inside the bag so this is what you have to do you have to dip it down under the iris and in the bag and then push it so automatically the leading haptic will go into the bag once it is done you can easily dial the rest of the eye wall into the bag so this is a video just demonstrate the technique the first thing is you have to place the eye wall above the iris make sure that the both the haptics are oriented at 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock then engage the distal dialing hole drag it towards the center depress it place it into the bag then you can uh, hold the optic haptic junction just push it and make sure that it goes at 4 o'clock so the so then only the whole haptic which is trailing haptic goes into the anterior chamber then just hold the uh, proximal lens dial it dip it and then rotate it it will make it easily go into the bag so these are my 10 simple uh, uh, tips to make the surgery safer thank you for this great opportunity thank you thank you pawan very useful tips for uh, uh, people who are beginning to do this technique um, so we'll, we'll we'll go on with the next talk uh, where uh, dr shankar who is again a very good a prolific surgeon from arvind eye hospital madurai who has got a very good experience in doing small incision so he is going to uh talk today about how do we deal with some of the difficult cataracts especially the brown and black cataracts because these are cataracts uh, uh, which really small incision is really a, a, a very good technique to do in some of these cataracts but there are some key points which we have to keep in mind so uh shankar is my uh, slides uh seen sir yeah yes shankar your audio is also clear you can uh...
Yes, Shankar, you can start. Yes, sir. Light is, show. It, is it visible, sir? Sorry to ask again. Yes, Shankar, it is visible. Since the basic steps have all been covered uh, more clearly and very much precisely by the previous speakers, I would just like to move on with the main important steps that are important for handling harder cataracts. The harder cataracts can be uh, round cataracts, mature cataracts, or even uh, subluxated brown or any complicated cataract. These four main these steps are the very much important ones that we need to take care of. Uh, so moving on to the basic steps, the tunnel, uh, as Dr. Avani has, and uh, Dr. Bill and uh, Dr. Uh, Pavan have insisted, uh, even here, the, uh, the tunnel, the basic important thing is to make sure that the tunnel is around uh, seven millimeter to eight millimeter wide, this clear incision made by the crescent. Slideshow mode. Is it visible? The video? You should go to slideshow mode. Start slideshow from current. Yeah. Full um, screen. That's okay, better. Shankar. Okay. Continue. So once the crescent is uh, once the tunnel is made with the crescent, it's uh, it has to be seven to eight millimeter wide. And uh, the measurement is shown with the uh, vernier caliper. And uh, moving on with the same crescent, we can make the inner corneal lip, which has to be 8 to 10 millimeter or at least wider than the uh, outer scleral incision. The entire tunnel needs to be around 2.5 millimeter wide. And once the internal corneal lip is done with the crescent, it's opened up using a bubble down keratome. And like Dr. Kapil said, it is important that we open up the uh, side pockets very well because it's a large nucleus that needs to get accommodated uh, out through the tunnel during delivery. And these, uh, in general, in small pupil, it is important that we have to visualize all the consecutive steps of the surgery after we uh, start from the rexus. So it is mandated that we have a very nice wide dilated pupil. Um, so the options that we have to dilate the pupil Intraoperatively, are it is the sim most simple one is to inject adrenaline, and even in spite of adrenaline, in older old age patients where we have dense PXF on the capsule or on the pupillary margin, the the uh, adrenaline injected will not help us to have a con consistently very well dilated pupil. So the options that we have here are either we can do a stretch pupiloplasty, as you can see on the left of the screen, or Placement of iris hooks as seen on, on the right. And in manual small incision cataract surgery, the most economical uh, part again is to have a multiple sphincterotomy, which gives a consistently very good dilatation throughout the surgery. And this is maintained throughout the surgery. Then now coming to the continuous carolinear capsular excess. Here again, like Dr. Kapil said, a large rexus around the, I prefer having it to the pupillary margin. So I start from the center of the pupil, which usually is the scope reflex point here. And once from there, I make it wide enough or large enough to the pupillary margin. I prefer to stay on the rexus margin, I mean rexus tap, so that I, the, the rexus doesn't run away. And all the other parameters of not pressing on this posterior uh, Corneal scleral lip is important to avoid shallowing of the chamber and thus uh, safeguarding the rexus from running away. Hydro dissection again. Here it is important that we not uh, concentrate on prolapsing the nucleus. Our agenda or aim is to just mobilize or free the nucleus from its adhesions to the bag. Here you can see me performing multiple hydro dissections. This is to safeguard the fact that the posterior capsule is not visible and we might rupture any posterior polar cataract addition or any other addition along the back. As you can see, the once the nucleus is mobile, the nucleus can be lifted freely using a Sinsky cannula. Again, here the importance is having a large rexus and multiple gentle hydro dissections. Moving on to prolapsing the nucleus. Once the rexus is large enough and the nucleus is being well mobile, 
we can we can go ahead with prolapsing the nucleus. The prolapsing the nucleus again. You can see here bimanual prolapse being done for a black cataract. Since the uh, it's a really hard black cataract as shown here, it is not much visible over the screen. So again, I would like to show it in a much larger uh, here. You can see me going from the scratching the center of the Sinsky scapula. I've reached the equator. I have prolapsed the nucleus gently. This has been comfortably done mainly because of, I have a very well dilated pupil and a larger excess to uh, help me achieve this. Imagine this kind of a hard nucleus, hard, wide, and large nucleus being prolapsed through such a small pupil. This is the uh, pupil that was at the beginning of the case. So even though we uh, people like uh, Dr. Venkatesh and Haripriya Madam might deliver it through this pupil, the consistency towards uh, consistency of the surgery really needs to have a very large rexus and a large pupil. And moving on to nucleus delivery. Sorry, I would like to make a small change here. Sorry. Now this is again a large uh, rexus comfortably being prolapsed. But in case you have a In case in this, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Here again, you can see I am performing a rexus here in a nucleus that's showing a little bit of pre of phacodonosis. I hope the phacodonosis is visible. The rexus is complete. And I'm doing a gentle hydro dissection. And the nucleus prolapses through one pole, which indicates my rexus is larger over that side and smaller over the other, other half. So I should have normally, I should have uh, gone and prolapsed the nucleus through the left-hand side. But instead, when I tried to prolapse through the right-hand side where the excess is small, you can see it can cause a zonal dialysis if I proceeded with it. Rather, I go through the, the area where the excess is large, prolapse the nucleus via bimanual prolapse technique by placing a, a spatula underneath. When the spatula is placed underneath and the nucleus is prolapsed over the spatula or rotated or wheeled out with the spatula underneath, the pressure is directed to the spatula and not to the tonules or the deep capsule behind. This reduces the chances of having a zonal dialysis or a uh, PC tag. Now coming to nucleus delivery. Once the bag, once the nucleus is prolapsed out into the uh, chamber, we have to first check whether the vectus, whether the vectus is patterned. I mean, all the irrigating ports are uh, opened up, and then we can always deliver the nucleus comfortably in a large, very well made tunnel, very wide made tunnel. But in case we have a, a nucleus that is stuck to the tunnel, we still have the option of wheeling it out using a Sinsky hook. Using a Sinsky hook, like you can see here, the nucleus is stuck in the tunnel, and you can see me wheeling it out using a Sinsky hook. This is an option. And the other option is to take out the uh, nucleus piece by piece, as shown here. Now, both these techniques might be safe, can be um, successful on that given day, but the next day we might end up with a corneal uh, edema and a striate keratopathy. Rather, Check the width of the tunnel with a visco cannula, and if, if you suspect that the tunnel is not wide enough, extend it with a keratome, double down keratome before delivery. And the next day, eventually, you will have a clear cornea. Moving on to cortex removal, I would just like to emphasize whatever Dr. Kapil has said is very much true. And this is a uh, case of an albinism patient with brown cataract. I just uh, took up this video for a better uh, 
understanding of the cortex wash. Here you can see the cortex wash being a very smooth one. It is much easier to do the cortex wash here in this case because it's not a much, much weak bag. The next set of the case that I'm going to show you, I am hope the uh, audience can appreciate the weakness in the bag while I do the cortex wash. I hope the weakness in the bag is noted. And I would take a minute from now to just show you this area over here. I hope it is visible and as shown in the uh, visible cannula. This is an adduction area that has been caused or noted in the nucleus. Here is, if in the, in the white portion, if you can see, this was the portion that was stuck to the posterior capsule. So if I had made a hydroprolapse in a single wave hydroprolapse forcefully, I would have ruptured this and I might have caused a PC pad. And the rest of the steps are the same as uh, the regular procedures like placing a new, uh, placing an IOL in the bag, uh, in the bag or on the uh, sulcus bed. Usually in, in cases where brown mature black cat tracks, the posterior capsule tends to be a little weak. So it is always preferable to do a optic capture where the optic is in the bag and the haptics in the sulcus. And this is a paper that has been published by Dr. Vengdesh sir uh, regarding uh, black cat tracks. And now you can see the techniques that as spoken and taught to us by him has shown very good results in post-op in terms of uh, post complication. This This is very minimal for the numbers they have done. It's a very less number of eyes which had edema or iritis or even the FM that is, it's, it's very less. And post-operative visual acuity have also been much better in these size. So I hope uh, to summarize, in general, it's just everything needs to be large. In SACS, it needs to be large, like large tunnel, large rexes, bimanual prolapse, gentle removal of the nucleus out of the chamber and as well as a very carefully done cortex wash. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shankar. I think it's very important uh, the summarization uh, to keep in mind everything have to be large here because the lens is going to be large. So you have to be kind hearted and make everything large so that you at the end of the day, you can do a very safe uh, SICS in some of these hard cataracts. But once you start doing some of these hard cataracts, you would notice that the time you take for a regular cataract and this would be the same. So uh, next I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Janani, who is a pediatric ophthalmologist, to share her experience on you know, where, uh, how to do the small incision in pediatric cataracts. Ideally, we would do a FACO and put a foldable lens, but again, where there is uh, less resources and where there is very difficult for them to have access to the technology, this, this would still imply. So she will sum up her, uh, share her experience on doing small incision in pediatric cataracts. Thank you, sir, for the great opportunity. Is it uh, visible, sir, my slides? Yes, yes, Janet. Yes. Thank you. I'm just going to uh, give a gist about pediatric SICS. So cataracts in children not only blur the retinal image, but also disrupts the development of immature visual pathways. So timely intervention is very much needed uh, in children. So timing of surgery, uh, in congenital cataracts, surgery is done after six weeks of birth when the baby is actually uh, dynamically, uh, hemodynamically stable and fit for general anesthesia. In case of bilateral cataracts, interval between the eyes uh, usually give uh, is one month uh, interval between the two eyes. So surgical options um, in uh, children under uh, one year of age, uh, IUL implantation is not intended usually. Only cataract extraction with posterior primary posterior capsular excess with anti vitrectomy is uh, ideal. Uh, these children are given aphakic glasses and or contact lens. Between uh, one year age and eight years, IUL can be implanted with under correction of estimated IUL power. So primary primary posterior capsular excess and anti vitrectomy is very uh, most important uh, step in these uh, children to prevent PCO formation. More than eight years of age, uh, PPC and anterior vitrectomy uh, is not required as these children would be very cooperative for India. 
uh, lasers in case of PCO formation. How cataract surgery is going to be different from uh, adult? So intraoperative uh, factors, children will have low scleral rigidity. There are high chance of wound leak and fish mouthing of the internal wound. So we have to always ensure about the tightness of the wound at the end of the surgery. Anterior capsule, again, it is going to be very tough and elastic, very challenging part for the operating surgeon. The increased chance of uveal inflammation and PCO formation and post-operative amblyopia are the challenges. So we're going to show a three-minute video of pediatric uh, SICS. So it is sterile. Sorry. It is sterile or uh, clear corneal incisions can be made depending on uh, preference of operating surgeon. We prefer to use superior wound as it is well covered by the uh, lids, upper lid. Scleral tunnel of 2.8 to 3 mm incision is made. Anterior capsule is stained with drip and blue. So, anterior capsule is given nick. Rexis is fashioned with the micro rexis forceps. Frequent grasping and re grasping of the capsular flap allows better control of rexis. So, here, fours on the anterior capsule should be centripetal and upwards towards the corneal endothelia to pre prevent peripheral extension of the rexus. So ideally, we can aim for 4.5 to uh, 6 mm rexus. 4.5 to 5 mm rexus. Now, anterior capsular rexus is then completed. Multiple hydro dissection and hydro delineation is done to loosen up the cortex. So it is then aspirated with irrigation aspiration simple cannula. So lens cortex and nucleus are generally soft in children. So usually ultrasonic pico emulsification is not required as lens is very soft in these children. It is important to remove all cortical uh, material as thorough as possible to prevent reproliferation of lens epithelial cells. So ideally, uh, posterior capsular excess can be performed either before or after IOL implantation. We have single piece foldable acrylic IOL is placed safely inside the bag. In case acrylic eye oil, foldable eye oil is not available, section can be enlarged. A rigid PMMA lens can also be used. The posterior capsular excess is then fashioned carefully in a controlled manner. We should aim for 2.5 to 3 mm posterior capsular excess. So now you can see the clearly posterior capsular excess is then completed now, followed by anterior vitrectomy. Automated anterior vitrectomy is done, which mainly breaks the scaffold for proliferating cells, thus preventing PCO formation. So wound is secured with two sutures. No paracentesis is actually done here. The smallest incision as much as possible is so I want to show you a challenging case of posterior lenticonus with PHPV. It's a case of limited anterior PHPV. So 2.8 well down character entry. So anterior capsular excess is then fashioned carefully in a controlled manner. You can see persistent fetal vasculature here with posterior lenticonus. After careful hydro dissection, cortical materials are then aspirated. You can see the updrawn ciliary processes. So I started the posterior capsular excess in between I implanted the lens. It was about to extend it 
So now posterior left capsular excess is completed. So here clear cut defined posterior left capsular excess is not possible as there was a thick block. So I cut with one as this. Now gentle anterior vitrectomy is done. So this is actually a case of uh, uh, microphthalmus. I had to place plus 40 diopter uh, uh, acrylic lens inside safely inside the bag. So take home message. Cataracts can be removed relatively smaller incision. So for beginners, uh, start with the smaller excess as a lens. Um, Aim for a very small excess to prevent uh, runaway excess. As there is no uh, hard uh, nucleus, so ultrasonic uh, power is not actually required in all cases. So hydrophobic acrylic eye oil is a preferred choice of lens to prevent PCO formation again. So this is the most important step, primary posterior capsular excess, capsulotomy and uh, anterior vitrectomy, less than seven to eight years of age. So coming to eye oil calculation, so less than two years, according to Dahan's formula, 20% under correction of the estimated eye oil power is done. Two to eight years, 10% under correction, whatever uh, uh, estimated eye oil power. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Venkateshwar, Myers, uh, and Dr. Haripriya, madam, for the great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Janani, uh, for covering this uh, topic. It gives a completion also to this technique. Uh, so now we'll see some of the challenging scenarios and how to manage that. Uh, Dr. Vivek, uh, is my colleague in Pondicherry, will be talking about this. Um, good evening and good morning, everybody. So I'll be talking about challenging situations we face in manual small incision cataract surgery. This video is basically for beginners who face problems with pupil, capsule, epinuclear uh, remnants, and uh, nucleus. So the most common pro problem faced by everyone is having a small pupil during surgery. So what do we do when we have a small pupil in uh, SICS? First, we try pharmacologically. You know, after making the uh, superior sclerocorneal tunnel, you make a paracentesis, you use adrenaline, uh, you to achieve some dilatation. So you use di diluted adrenaline with uh, BSS. So if adrenaline doesn't work, what do we do next? We use viscoelastic. Viscoelastic will give you at least one millimeter of dilatation, but in patients such as uh, who have pseudo exfoliation or traumatic uh, cataracts, uh, midriasis will not happen. In that case, what do we do? So first option is doing a multiple sphincterotomy. So multiple sphincterotomy, you give radial cuts on the pupillary margin, the number of cuts varying somewhere between three and five, depending upon the size of the nucleus. If the nucleus is hard, you'll have to give five cuts. So once you've uh, had uh, uh, this uh, multiple sphincterotomy, you're going to cause permanent damage to the pupil structure. So it is the points to take is radial cuts, half the length of the iris, equidistant from each other, three to five cuts. The other uh, technique for enlarging the pupil is a stretch pupiloplasty. For this, you will need two Kuglen hooks. So the Kuglen hooks, one through the side port and one through the main incision. So you split them so that they go till the limbus. So this will give you a dilatation of extra dilatation of two to three millimeters. The problem with this is the damage done to the uh, structure of the pupil is going to be permanent. And multiple micro is uh, what happens when you stretch the Kugel uh, and next will be the iris hook usage of iris hooks. So iris hooks, you know, we've uh, used it in phacoemulsification in uh, and now in SICS. So the main tip here is to have the iris hooks placed at the edge of the tunnel and not in the tunnel area. When you are going to have the iris hook in the tunnel area, you will have button holing or at the end of surgery, it will be difficult for you to uh, form the anterior chamber. So make sure you have it at the end of the tunnel. So four hooks should be uh, enough. So in cases like this, where the uh, cataract, you have a pl plaquey uh, anterior lens capsule and you do not know where how large the nucleus is, it's always better to have iris hooks placed. So the iris hooks are placed after you construct the tunnel and paracentesis. 
So here we do a large rexus and then we uh, hook out the nucleus since the nucleus is much larger. So usually after nucleus delivery, you can deliver the nucleus as such or if the nucleus is small, you can remove the iris hooks which are closer to the uh, wound, uh, deliver the nucleus and then wash cortex and remove the remaining uh, iris hooks at the end. The one other important point is uh, you cannot use uh, the uh, Bhattacharya ring or the Malugen ring when you are doing a manual small incision cataract surgery. The maximum you can use are iris hooks. Since the nucleus size is large and you are going to remove the nucleus in total, it is always better to use iris hooks. Coming to the problems related uh, to the capsule, uh, most of uh, us are FACO surgeons, we are used to making small uh, rexes. So, when you are going to uh, do a large rexis or aim to do a large rexis, the common problem you are going to face in an intumescent cataract like this is a runaway rexis. So when you have a runaway rexis, what I would recommend is go and complete your uh, capsulotomy with a can opener technique. So if you give radial uh, cuts with the vernas on the other side and complete uh, your rexis with the forceps, the problem you are going to have is one weak area. Uh, that is going to cause a lot of problem when you are going to do a hydro dissection. So if you give a lot of radial cuts, like 10 to 15 cuts per quadrant, uh, you can proceed with a regular uh, SICS like hydroprolapse and uh, uh, the remaining steps will be the same. So one other common problem is we end up having a small rexis like in this video, where the nucleus is going to be very large. If you, uh, the main tip here is to do radial cuts on all four quadrants so that it becomes like a can opener and you can proceed with your surgery as such. One other thing that you can do when you have a small rexis is give an oblique cut on the rexis margin and use a rexis holding forceps uh, to complete a double rexis toward the desired size, desired size. Coming to the next topic, intumescent cataract. So intumescent cataract, the problem is when you're going to do a rexis, what happens is you will end up having an Argentina flag set. So what I prefer to do is debulk the bag in one go drain the uh, cortical fluid from the back, fill the bag with viscoelastic and do a small capsulorexis. So after doing the small capsulorexis, rem remove the remaining cortical fluid, fill the bag with viscoelastic, give a radial cut and do a double rexis. You can either use a forceps or you can use a Simco cannula, aspirate to the tip of the uh, flap and complete your double rexis to the desired size. Make sure you inject a lot of viscoelastic into the bag. Coming to the next part of the uh, video. Uh, coming to the next part of the video, it is the uh, dreaded Argentina flag sign. So when the intralenticular pressure is high, this is what is going to happen. So preoperatively, it is better to give uh, a manitol or uh, oral glycerol to these patients. In this case, you see the Argentina flag sign has uh, occurred when we were trying to do a modified envelope technique. So here the cortex is a little bit thicker. You don't have runny uh, liquid cortex. So when the cortex is thicker, always uh, give radial cuts on the uh, extended side, kind of finish your capsulotomy and then deliver the nucleus. After delivering the nucleus uh, gently, you know, the remaining cortex is uh, washed and the IOL can be uh, placed in the bag when you have an Argentina flag sign. So what do we do if the uh, cortex is going to be very, uh, very liquidy cortex when there is no uh, epinuclear or cortical cushion uh, for the posterior capsule when this is the scenario, I would recommend removing the nucleus in total first as soon as you drain the uh, liquid cortex. After Because uh, the ALC will, in case you have a posterior extension, the ALC will support you. So after removing and washing off the uh, remnant cortical fibers, place the IOL in bag, give oblique cuts on the Argentina flag sign uh, margins and use a forceps to complete the capsulotomy to the desired size. If you do a very small capsulotomy, you'll end up having phimosis. So make sure the size is at least five to six millimeters. The other common problem faced by uh, beginners is uh, retained epinuclear bone. Like here, you have a soft cataract and a mid-dilated pupil where the rexis margin is not visible. So when you don't see the rexis margin, sometimes you end up doing a hydro delineation instead of dissection. So if you try to aspirate the epinuclear bowl with your Simco, it's going to take forever. 
So once you think there is a lot of epinucleus, do a hydro repeat hydro dissection or visco dissection, which will uh, float the entire boat. Or one other uh, way of doing it is use your Simco cannula, move it around uh, so that you do a hydro dissection with your Simco cannula, a blind hydro dissection. So once the bowl is separate, when you tap on the iris at the equator, it is gently going to float into the anterior chamber and it can be removed. The main idea is to do repeat hydro dissection and visco dissection to remove retained uh, epinuclear bow. So coming to posterior polar cataract, uh, this is a FACO video, but the principles are same. What I would recommend is do partial hydro dissections, which do not go through the entire uh, posterior pole, just partial hydro dissection so that you separate the cortex from the uh, back. Once that is done, do multiple hydro delineations. So in this case, we do two hydro delineations. So the main idea here is to separate the nucleus from the epinucleus. Once the uh, hydro delineation is done, separate the nucleus from the uh, bag, remove it, and then gently do visco dissection in multiple quadrants. So that even if you have a posterior capsular dehiscence, chances of uh, the epinuclear bowl falling into the vitreous cavity is nil. So it will come in toto outside. It will come in toto into the anterior chamber and gently you can deliver the epinuclear bowl. And if there is a PC degesense, it is going to be easy to manage. So you can avoid dropping of the nucleus or epinuclear bowl by uh, doing partial uh, hydro dissection and uh, delineation for uh, debulking the nucleus. So coming to the uh, last part of the uh, challenging scenario is a phacolytic glaucoma. So in these cases, the intraocular pressure is going to be very high and the cornea is going to be very hazy and the eye is going to be inflamed. So once you have a patient like this, put him on topical steroids, uh, give the patient intra, you can uh, put the patient on IV mannitol and then take him up for surgery. So when you take him up for surgery, create the tunnel, make a paracentesis, drain all the cortical fluid that is there in the anterior chamber. Most important step is to stain the capsule properly. In these cases, uh, the uh, uh, bag complex is going to be, in generally, it's going to be weak. Uh, so you can, uh, if the bag is too weak, you can uh, do your rexis with the forceps. In this case, it was not that weak, so we had, uh, I could do it uh, with the cystitome. Once the rexis is complete, a gentle uh, prolapse of the nucleus uh, man, uh, by hooking it out and visco delivery is done. But here you see a lot of retained uh, liquid cortex behind the posterior capsule. If you leave it, it is going to take a lot of time to absorb and uh, the visual recovery is going to be slow. So what we did is we created a small nick in the posterior capsule, drained the cortical fluid, did a little bit of anterior vitrectomy and placed the IOL in sulcus. So the main tip here is to pay, take the patient with IV mannitol, uh, be very careful about the bag complex. If the bag is too weak, do not try for a secondary IOL in the initial stages. You can remove the entire uh, bag nucleus complex and wait for the uh, inflammation to reduce and uh, do a secondary IOL later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. We'll uh, quickly go to the next uh, topic. I think we're uh, slightly overshooting the time, but we would complete all the talks in uh, the stipulated two hours time. So we may have to exceed for the question and answer session. So the people who are interested can uh, start putting your questions and then we'll take uh, some of them at a later time. So uh, Dr. Madhu Shekhar, who is again a very senior uh, uh, SICS surgeon based at Madurai Narayanai Hospital, will be talking about uh, how do we do in small incision very safely in compromised zonules, you know, patients who have subluxated lenses and also weak zonules as a zero exfoliation. Madhu? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity, sir, Dr. Venkatesh, sir, and uh, Dr. Nayas. So today I'm going to present uh, on uh, manually small incision and cataract surgery in subluxated cataract. So I have no financial interest. So after the pre-op evaluation uh, that uh, uh, surgeons should uh, characterize the and draw the general defect location of defect and presence or absence of vitreous in the anterior chamber. And depending on uh, the general defect, we can uh, plan the incision site also. 
and examination in supine position is also very important to gauge the amount of subluxation and plan for the removal route, whether anterior route or first planar route. So going to surgical planning, uh, if that zonal dialysis is mild, then we can go with uh, CTR alone. If it is a moderate, then we can go with uh, along with the uh, hook and CTR. And if it is severe, then we can go for fixation uh, method with uh, CONE or CTS. And uh, if it is uh, very advanced, then we can go for cataract ex extraction with uh, iris fixation and or scar fixation of IO. So uh, I will go directly to the capsulorexis, what precaution we have to take during capsulorexis. Sometimes uh, uh, if you miss any this uh, uh, dialysis during a, uh, pre-op evolution and uh, there is generalized weakness like in PXF or this type of hard brown cataract, you can, uh, most of the cases you will notice uh, uh, this phacodonesis or iodophacodonesis during rexis. Like in this case, you can notice that whole uh, back is moving. And uh, uh, other tip for rexis that uh, uh, you can start rexis in the area where zonules are intact and you can make it slightly larger in the area where zonules are intact and smaller in the area where there is zonodialysis. And in SICS, you have to make a slightly larger uh, opening uh, so that it, uh, you can prolapse the nucleus easily without stress on the zonules. So this, uh, uh, I, uh, this uh, Vivek has covered and other uh, speakers have also covered. This biomanual technique, we have to, all we have to learn uh, if you are dealing with this type of hard cataract or subluxated cataract. So here we have to use, uh, I'm showing the animation of this bimodal prolapse. So we have to use two instruments, Sinsky hook in a dominant hand and is cyclodialysis spatula in non-dominant hand. So spatula will act as a fulcrum and it will uh, reduce the stress on the jonules. So here uh, uh, I'm showing uh, uh, one tip to deal with uh, subluxated cataract. Here you can, uh, use a cyclodialysis spatula. Here you can see that I am supporting the back. Uh, so you can support your back uh, when you are wheeling out the uh, one pole of nucleus so that it will reduce your stress on the jonules and that bag will not come along with your uh, nucleus. So I'm, I'm going to show two videos. Uh, one uh, videos, uh, first video I'm showing with uh, uh, dialysis of uh, three to four clock hour in inferior dialysis. So after making a good tunnel, uh, you can initiate your axis with a uh, sharp cystitome and then you can complete your axis with uh, utrata forcep or the castor axis forcep. And you can see that uh, inferior, there is a three to four clock hour dialysis. So I'm supporting the bag with uh, uh, three Aris hooks, you can use capsule hooks also. And after doing a gentle hydrodissection, you can collapse the nucleus and uh, you can deliver the nucleus. But in SICS, you have to keep in mind that uh, while delivering the nucleus, it may uh, go come out your hooks. So you have to again reposition the hooks and uh, cortex aspiration, we have to do in a tangential manner instead of uh, pulling it radially to reduce the stress on your nose. Here I'm using a CTR injector to place a CTR in the back and then I will, you can place it in the sulcus or back. Here I'm placing in the back and then you can uh, remove the hooks. Second video I'm going to show, uh, this is a mature intumescian cataract with uh, trauma with crumpled back and uh, pre-existing vitreous in the anterior chamber. So after making a good large tunnel, you can uh, stain the capsule and you can go for anterior vitectomy first. And uh, as in previous case, you can start your, as I told that we can start uh, rexis with a sharp needle, a sharp cystitome, and then complete your rexis. And then uh, you can support your back 
with uh, ID soaks or capsule loops, whichever it is available. And uh, you can place CTR sometimes in larger dialysis. I used to place CTR before uh, delivering the nucleus. And you can use bimanual prolapse to wheel out the nucleus out the back. And then the nucleus is delivered out. And the cortex is washed in tangential manner instead of pulling it radially. Then you can place IL either in the sulcus or back. Then I have used a time slow state to visualize the remaining vitreous and vitectomy is done. Sometimes uh, in uh, gross subluxation or like uh, in this case, it is anterior dislocated lens. So I'm going to do uh, uh, cataract extraction with uh, iris fixation of IUL. So after the, doing a good tunnel, making good tunnel, you can uh, put uh, higher viscosity, visco elastic uh, below the nucleus so that it doesn't drop and then uh, extract the nucleus then uh, you have to do good vitrectomy, anti automated vitrectomy, manual vitrectomy uh, in the pupillary area and just behind the iris. Like it, this was traumatic cataract and there was traumatic metastasis, so pupil was dilated. So I am constricting the pupil mechanically. Then you have to pass uh, uh, 9 0 or 10 0 proline suture, which comes uh, with a long curved needle. And you have to pass the needle from cornea, iris. And you have to take care that bite should not be too long. It should be two millimeter in length. And it should be between one third, outer one third and inner two third junction. And after externalizing the suture, uh, proline suture below the iris, uh, leading haptic is looped and tucked behind the iris. And uh, uh, suture is made taut so that it goes at the optic haptic junction. Similarly, that uh, trailing haptic is also looped and then uh, tucked behind the iris. Then the next step is to, we have to externalize the suture which is above the iris through the power synthesis near that area. And we have to sec uh, secure the suture with uh, five to six knots. So uh, first on the left hand side, then on the right hand sides, that similar Maneuver we have to do, and we have to secure with five to six knots. And uh, uh, one more topic I am going to cover that uh, when to convert uh, your FECO wound into SICS and how to convert. Like this case, uh, it is a clovermeter SI with uh, grade and uh, nucleus grading three, third, three to four. And uh, after having making good rexes. Uh, during hydro dissection, there is a blowout of uh, rexis. So I started uh, chop, first chop, then uh, second chop, then you can see that nucleus is started tilting down. So I injected a uh, higher viscosity viscoelastic below the nucleus and wheeled out the nucleus in the, into anterior chamber. Then I changed my site. Uh, I was doing FECO in, on temporal side. I shifted to superior side and made, uh, after the connectable dissection, I made a six millimeter uh, sclerocorneal tunnel. And then you have to Take, because you, this is uh, conversion you have to do when you are in initial stage of FECO, when whole nucleus, big nucleus is there, this method is very useful. One more video I'm going to show that uh, in this case, it was a mature cataract with uh, history of past prana vitectomy. So while initiating uh, first chop only, you can see that fluctuation in the anterior chamber. You can see fluctuation in the anterior chamber. But one mistake I did, I suddenly came out. You can stay there in foot pedal one and inject uh, viscoelastic through side panel and then uh, slowly come out. So you can, uh, after uh, changing your site, you can make a slow corneal tunnel 
and uh, deliver the nucleus do cortex was interpreted to me and place iol in the sulcus thank you thank you dr madhu uh, for the nice talk on uh, uh, adding on the conversion part also which is also very important uh, we have uh, dr david who, who is with the himalayan cataract project they have done a lot of uh, extensive uh, high volume cataract campaigns is going to share his experience on that uh, for the next 5 minutes yes david your uh, mic is it unmuted Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, David. Please continue. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of hacks that I've learned as a result of participating in high volume cataract surgery campaigns with the uh, Himalayan Cataract Project in Ethiopia. Those of you that are familiar with their work know that um, they decreased uh, cataract blindness in Nepal over a 20 year period by 58%. And they're now applying their system to many other countries. So fundamentally, their system is one that focuses on training to meet the future needs of the backlog of blindness and the high volume cataract surgery campaigns to take care of the current backlog. And in those campaigns, there will typically be two to 400 cataracts that are done per day among five surgeons. So in a week, it'll be 1,200 to 1,500 cataracts. And some of the surgeons will be doing 85 to 100, 120 cataracts a day. So the technique of the M6 technique in those circumstances is driven by the limited resources as well as the critical need for safety. And so there are two major changes that came in my technique as a result of participating in these campaigns. The first was uh, adoption of the envelope technique. I had been doing the capsule rexus as well as the can opener. Um, the envelope capsulotomy consists fundamentally of doing a subincisional cut with the keratome and then making two relaxing incisions with the vanus scissors. It has the advantage of not needing any tripan glue. And because the flap folds over the anterior iris, it ensures that the leading haptic of the IOL goes into the bag. Conversely, if there's a rupture in the posterior capsule, you can lay that anterior capsular flap down over that rupture and then that ensures that the leading haptic will go into the sulcus. The disadvantage is that at the end of the case, you must cut and remove the flap. So this is a video taken of the monitor in one of these camps. So very quickly, this is finalizing the incision. And at that point, the keratome makes the incision in the uh, proximal capsule, and then the vaness relaxes with two re relaxing incisions. And after things are removed, you can see the flap there uh, and viscoelastic is placed underneath the flap and it folds the flap back over the iris ensuring placement of the leading haptic into the capsular bag. Uh, the second change was using the Simcoe for all steps of nuclear, uh, nucleus removal and nucleus manipulation. So first of all, hydrodissection is done by placing the Simcoe wide open on the irrigation underneath the capsular flap. Um, then prolapse of the pole of the nucleus is done by infraducting the eye and then placing pressure as is seen in this drawing external to the wound. So this is essentially at the lens equator which causes the superior pole of the nucleus to pop anterior to the anterior capsule. From this point, the Simcoe is then moved into the eye and is used to slide under that pole as well as the, the lateral edges of the nucleus and move the nucleus fully into the anterior chamber. And then the nucleus itself is expressed with the Simcoe by moving it under the cataract and sliding it out. It's important that as you're removing it with the Simcoe that you not move it up against the endothelium but rather the pressure is downward towards the floor of the incision. I liken it a little bit like catching an egg that someone has thrown to you that you need to sort of 
go downwards rather than going up to meet it. And so very quickly here, this is the hydro dissection under the flap. This is the popping of the nucleus anteriorly and then removal. And we'll do it one more time in slow motion. So this is the hydro dissection here taking place underneath the flap. The Simcoe now comes out of the eye with slight pressure and you see the prolapse dialing it into the anterior chamber gently and then going beneath it and removing it fully from the eye. So um, I have a website I've recently started, globalophthalmology.org, and this video and some other steps will soon be posted there. So thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think uh, uh, we have finished with uh, all our talks. Uh, there are a lot of questions, so we'll, we'll try to take uh, a few of them uh, as we roll on. Uh, first, uh, there's a very uh, eminent panelist here. Now we have uh, uh, Dr. Surendra Basti uh, from uh, Northwestern University, who has, who has started his practice in India, and uh, now he is in U.S. Uh, doing cornea and refractive surgery. So uh, I, I just want him to share his experience on dealing with intumescent cataracts. Dr. Bustin. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I really learned a lot from this webinar, uh, some amazing surgeons and amazing tips. So thank you very much. It's truly an honor to be on, on this and thanks to Bill. Um, but um, in terms of uh, any tips to share, I would say that, you know, intumescent cataracts are challenging cataracts. And I think uh, focusing on the preoperative uh, slit lamp exam, I think is an important consideration while planning surgery. I know we have uh, many residents on this call and, and some of these comments are directed towards them. But on the slit lamp, really three considerations to focus on uh, in intumescent cataracts the convexity of the anterior capsule. So that tells you whether the capsular bag is uh, really swollen and the intralenticular pressure uh, is elevated. So if you have a very convex uh, anterior uh, capsule, um, that could give you a clue that the intralenticular pressure is high. And you, you examine that by just using a narrow slit that you focus on the anterior lens capsule and that'll show you the contour of the anterior lens capsule. The light comes from about 45 degrees, so that'll clearly delineate the contour of the anterior lens capsule. So that's your first clue towards the potential risk of uh, increased intralenticular pressure and an Argentinian flag uh, occurring intraoperatively. The second important consideration to look for is the status of the cortex and specifically looking for fluid clefts uh, in the anterior cortex. And again, presence of fluid clefts tells you the intralenticular pressure is elevated the third consideration uh, in a preoperative exam uh, is really to look at the anterior chamber depth. And if it's a, a shallow depth, then it tells you that the likelihood that you can have a extension of the a small initial capsulotomy to create an anterior, uh, to create an anterior Argentinian flag sign is going to be higher. So it just gives you those clues in your preoperative assessment, which I think is a, a part of the exam really to focus on in uh, you know, white cataracts. And if you have OCT looking at uh, the anterior capsule and if you see clefts, you know for sure that uh, the cortex is liquefied and your intralenticular pressure is gonna be elevated. So those are some uh, aspects to focus on in the preoperative exam in tumors and cataracts. Yeah, they're, they're very important uh, clues and uh, tips which we have to keep in mind no, in these cases so that uh, you use the right viscoelastic even uh, in in a developing world, normally we do with HPMC, but still, if it's a case like that, we can still use a high molecular weight viscoelastic so that you can uh, push the lens back and make sure you don't have the Argentinian flag. But there are several uh, methods to prevent it in small incision, but ideally landing in doing a smaller rexis and then enlarging it to a second rexis would be an ideal option if you're doing with HPMC. Uh, Jeff, uh, there are a lot of questions to you, but we'll try to take one or two now with you. Uh, so how, how many cases of FACO, no, you believe some surgeons in US have done before they learn a small incision? Yeah, it's a very good question. 
what I would say is I'll speak primarily to to uh, residents. So residents, you're going to finish your training with you know roughly between you know 150 to perhaps 250 cataract surgeries on average, and at that point you still are a beginner. And there's some good studies showing that your learning curve as a surgeon that's going to continue for up to 10 years. So you can really adopt this technique at any point. But let me just give you three tips. The first tip is master the scleral tunnel. That's something you can do with models, particularly. Uh, pig eyes, goat eyes, anything you have that has sclera, you can do hundreds and hundreds of scleral tunnels and really master the uh, accurate depth you need. Second would be find a textbook or a handbook. The, the Aravind handbook is perfect. The Academy also published uh, a small series on this. Orba Cybersight uh, also has some resources. And then finally, you have to find an experienced mentor to help you. If you're trying to learn this on your own, you're really going to likely uh, do some harm along the way that could be prevented by finding an experienced mentor. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, um, Dr. Priya, I think uh, there are a few questions for you. Like, how can you lessen the risk of PCR while doing uh, in mature and also in uh, patients with uh, pseudo exfoliation with dense cataracts? Some of the tips have been shared, but uh, you can also share some important points with you. I think many of the videos uh, are very clearly demonstrated what could be done, what has to be done the right way. Uh, as uh, correctly asked, in hard cataracts and mature cataracts, the chance of a PCR is uh, much higher. The zonules are weaker, the capsule is thinner. So one has to ensure the entire pathway the nucleus would traverse has to be large enough, uh, which would mean your incision has to be large enough, your pupil has to be large enough, and your excess has to be large enough. So if your pupil is small, which may be the case in many of these senile cataracts, you may consider doing a sphincterotomy. Uh, to me, in SICS, the best way to enlarge the pupil would be a sphincterotomy because the hooks may not wait, work very well uh, because it will cause more crowding in the anterior chamber. So multiple small sphincterotomies uh, over the pupillary sphincter, maybe about four to five, works very well. You still have a circular pupil end of it. The second most important is also to have a large capsular rexus. So you may sometimes have to go below the rexus because your sphincterotomies may just help enlarge the pupil, I mean, stretch the pupil for your nucleus collapse, but not really enlarge it completely. So you have to have at least a 6.57 millimeter rexus here. Uh, so all the precautions you would take to ensure you have a complete rexus is useful. And if not, like Dr. Vivek showed, if your rexus does run out, you may want to convert it to a can opener. Uh, make it large enough. And if you have a rexus, then you can go and do a hydro dissection. Multiple small squirts uh, helps to make the nucleus mobile. Mature lenses, obviously, it's already mobile. Uh, and the prolapsing phase, as well, especially when you're having a small pupil, you'll have to ensure you're not hooking onto the capsule, the anterior capsule. So you can scratch the anterior nucleus up to start from the center of the pupil. Take your Sinsky by scratching on the anterior nucleus surface go to the equator of the nucleus and then get one pole out. And to continue to have that pole prolapse, use a second instrument like a spatula below that prolapsed pole and support it from below like a fulcrum and then wheel the nucleus out. So this technique, you can be sure you don't grasp the uh, capsule when you try to prolapse the nucleus out. So doing, uh, taking the systematic effort to do uh, uh, to ensure that you know you have a large enough nexus, you perhaps it properly. All of this is useful to try to prevent a posterior capsule rupture. You also have a higher chance of zonular loss in SICS, uh, which you don't see as much in FACO. And the reason is precisely this, because we tend to make a smaller nexus or we try to collapse the nucleus out through a small pupil. So these two has to be taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Uh, Brenton, uh, what about your experience of uh, your residents learning in uh, Will's Eye Institute? Sure. So uh, as, uh, as Jeff mentioned, our residents usually get somewhere between 150 and 250 FACO cases over the course of their training. Really what we try and do is as they're beginning their training process on M6, we start in the wet lab doing the tunneling. We really want to try and incorporate as few new techniques as possible going through the steps. So if you're used to using utrata forceps for your rexus, use utrata forceps for your rexus. Um, one of the other things that we try and direct them to do, a lot of our residents train on using bimanual IA, which is a little bit easier in terms of 
adopting a new technique than the Simcoe cannula, which they may not be as familiar with. So we try and again, maintain as many of those similar techniques as they get into the operating room. But um, in general, it's a little bit different if you're a FACO surgeon learning M6 versus if you are just a non-surgeon starting with M6 and you have to approach it from a slightly different manner. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kapil, so you, you recently launched small incision. There are a lot of questions related to that, but uh, you can just briefly tell people who are going to learn in the near future. It looks like from our polling, uh, most of them have not done any cases. And so they are waiting to do. So you covered some of the study material, but uh, what would you strongly recommend? I mean, you have seen between different techniques, people, what would you strongly recommend to them to prepare themselves? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Venkatesh. So, you know, as sort of we've mentioned kind of throughout the resources are, are super crucial um, as well as the wet lab uh, session, but I think case selection is probably the thing too. And in, in the last hour of the talk, we've seen um, very complex situations and I would highly recommend not starting with those. Um, and, and sort of going with like well dilated, uh, nose annular weakness, uh, good AC depth uh, to start off for the, those initial cases. Thank you, Kapil. Uh, Avni, so you have, you have done a lot of outreach after learning this technique. So uh, what did you find difficult from doing from an operating room where you have everything around you and uh, going to an outreach like where David uh, was telling? Uh, about the uh, atmosphere there and all the facilities and how do you accommodate? Yeah, so I think it, one of the variables when you're doing outreach work is that your equipment may be very different, uh, not what you're used to. So that ranges from microscope and view to the actual instruments that you have on your field to be able to do what you're doing. Um, there may be places where there aren't utrata forceps and you're used to using utratas. There may be places where you have to make your own cystotome out of needles. Um, and so I think if you're planning to do outreach, I would kind of repeat what I said before about learning lots of different techniques and learning to use different tools because uh, you never know what you're going to have. And, and also just having the people around you who are used to doing surgery in that setting show you how to make the best use of what you have. So if you don't know how to make a cystotome, just ask somebody, hey, I have this needle, what do I do with it? And it's really easy, you just bend it twice and then you have a cystotome. Um, additionally, people sometimes do feel very comfortable with a certain set of instruments and it's not difficult to carry your own instruments with you. So um, if you must use a utrata to do your, your capsulotomy, then bring a utrata with you to your outreach settings and you can just alcohol it off and continue using it. So I think um, microscope um, and tools tend to vary, but um, you can make it work for you. Okay, there's another uh, question to some of the senior panelists. Uh, what is the preferred technique for non zonula weakness? You know, when you don't have a retina backup, you know that if you're going to drop it, there is no chance, like in an outreach work. So what would you prefer to do? Madhu, you want to take that? Yes, sir. Uh, like uh, when you are dealing with uh, this uh, subluxated cataract, first we have to first do that pre-op evaluation that uh, like I told that uh, in uh, uh, examination in supine position, whether it is uh, going back or uh, it can be approached through anterior approach or posterior approach. If dialysis is uh, up to uh, uh, three to four o'clock hour, then we can proceed with uh, this SICS. And uh, if you are uh, uh, trained in uh, this small, in this uh, eyes fixation or scalar fixation, then there is no problem. But uh, when you are uh, uh, means good enough in uh, supporting your bag with capsule hooks and CTR, then that also helps. If, and uh, tunnel is very important. Tunnel, you have to make a large tunnel and a, a good tunnel. And uh, Lexis should also be, uh, Lexis should be slightly larger so that we can prolapse the nucleus without any uh, stress on the genres. And bimanual technique is very important in dealing with this type of cataract. So supporting bag with hooks and then putting CTR, uh, placement of CTR depends if it is a gross or generated weakness, then we can put it before prolapsing out the nucleus. 
because sometimes if you prolapse the nucleus, that bag will crumple and then it will be difficult for you to place the CTR. So we can sometimes, if there is generalized weakness, then we can place CTR before. And then uh, we can remove the hooks after placement of placing the IU. Okay, okay Mr. Katesh, can I comment? Yeah, yeah, yes, Prasthi. I was going to say that this may be one instance where I, I would think that uh, placing an anterior chamber maintainer can be very useful uh, when you have zonular dialysis, uh, just because it just ensures and provides an additional level of anterior chamber depth, which I think is critical in these cases. So uh, it's a simple thing to do. It's not our usual technique, but in this instance, I, I would certainly augment uh, irrigation into the eye. Oh, totally agree with you. No, but... The father of fluidics, Blumenthal, kept on saying, you know, how AC maintainer can make your cataract surgery so safe. So totally agree with you. So one uh, one of you, either Avni or Kapil can take, you know, as beginners who have learned now we are doing, how do you keep the pupil uh, uh, dilated till the end of the procedure? Because that's one issue which people who do small incision have. In between the technique, when you prolapse or you hydroprolapse or you use your Sinsky, the pupil bows down. So how do you avoid it? Yeah, so um, take all the steps you normally would. So use adrenaline in the beginning of the case and keep some extra on hand. You can always add some in later on. Uh, definitely make sure you start with a super enlarged pupil. So if it's borderline, do a couple sphincterotomies, make sure it's large. Uh, the main thing is trying to get the, um, the lens up and into the anterior chamber as quickly as possible when you're hydroprolapsing. So if you have one pole out and touching the iris for too long as you're fiddling with it, you can sort of make the iris kind of come down. Um, and if it gets stuck in the sulcus, it's very difficult to actually get out at that point. So once you have one pole prolapsed, try and be efficient about getting the whole thing up into the anterior chamber, uh, because if it's sort of hanging out too long then the iris will come down. Um, and if it does come down and, and you're still struggling, you can try and do adrenaline again. You can try sphincterotomies again. Um, at that point, using the Sinsky to kind of go under the iris, um, find the, the uh, equator of the lens, hook it, and bring it out up above the iris, and then dial it out into the anterior chamber usually works. Thank you, Avni, again. Uh, this question is to Priya, uh, because you do both the techniques uh, comfortably. Uh, which do you prefer for doing a posterior polar cataract? Like the case Vivek showed, if there is a posterior polar with a very hard nucleus and maybe with a soft nucleus. Uh, yeah, I think each of these techniques uh, has their own benefits. Uh, with the SICS technique in a posterior polar cataract, the advantage is all your forces are, uh, not, are, are more towards the cornea. So you tend to do a high, either to collapse the nucleus out so you don't have the fluid wave which push, tends to push the nucleus posteriorly. Whereas with the FACO technique, we the fluidics work such that you, if you have an open posterior capsule, the nucleus can dislocate into the witches. The chance of nucleus dislocation to the witches is probably higher in a FACO, in a posterior polar cataract. But uh, having said that, I think FACO also, once you have the right fluidics uh, set in place, and if you want to place a foldable lens, uh, FACO works uh, very well as well. But uh, either of these techniques, SICS or the FACO, I would prefer to make a slightly larger capsular rexus in a case of posterior polar cataract, even with FACO. Because in case during the FACO procedure or just as you're starting off, you find the nucleus still, so there is some kind of a compromise in the posterior capsule and you want to convert. If you have a larger capsular rexus, it's easier for you to bring the nucleus out into the uh, anterior chamber. So you want to convert to either SICS or do FACO in the uh, anterior chamber, partially prolapsed nucleus, it's good to have a light, slightly larger axis. But again, an axis is mandatory, as you, we all would know, because you have to have an option to place the lens in the sulcus if you have a poster capsule tear. So I, I think it would depend upon which technique the surgeon is comfortable with, and especially posterior polar being a more difficult uh, uh, category of case to deal with one has to be comfortable with that technique to date with that kind of a cataract. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, you have to be comfortable to do in in uh, some of these complex cases, especially posterior polar. If you are very good in FACO, I think you should stick on to doing a FACO with all those precautions. Uh, uh, we will take uh, one final question uh, uh, to our co-host, Bill. 
Will uh, what do you do if you have sub incisional or sub side port cortex? You learned recently. Now, what do you want to share some tips on that? Um, yes. Um, generally, uh, the best bet is to go sub paracentesis first. Uh, do some circumferential motion to under the anterior capsular leaf uh, to acquire the cortex and draw it into the center. It doesn't have to be fully removed from the eye at this point, but separated from the fornix. Then you should move over to the paracentesis where your chamber will be more similar uh, to what you see uh, in a FACO case. Um, and pretty much all the rest of the cortex should be available. Uh, key is to make sure you have a pretty tight seal uh, around the Simcoe needle so the chamber is stable. Uh, there can be danger if your Simcoe uh, cannula touches the posterior capsule, as I said before. Uh, there are often burrs on the Simcoe compared to most of the instruments we're used to uh, in our uh, FACO uh, set settings. Um, and uh, a second thing that can be helpful uh, is to direct uh, uh, the ringer's lactate uh, comment re referred to as saline uh, into the uh, fornix of the capsular bag in different regions. Uh, this will often loosen it. Uh, one, if necessary, could put some viscoelastic and do a visco uh, expression or visco separation of the cortex as well. Um, the most difficult is when you really can't see what you're doing. So some experience in uh, FACO cases where the pupil has been somewhat smaller uh, can be useful. And I do like the idea, um, uh, Dr. Osher, uh, Bobby Osher used to say that paracentesis are free, uh, particularly when they're around one millimeter or less, meaning as long as you don't connect them to each other, uh, you can pretty much uh, make little paracentesis anywhere you need them in order to complete the process. Uh, and a biaxial technique through uh, one millimeter paracentesis uh, usually works very well. Uh, obviously, you have to match the gauge of your uh, paracentesis to the gauge of your uh, biaxial system. Uh, I believe it's a 26 gauge needle corresponds to approximately a point uh, that will allow entry of uh, both capsule hooks and uh, the uh, micro uh, biaxial set. Okay, thank you, Bill. I, will, I would just uh, maybe, because using a rigid lens, it's very easy. Sometimes if you have a little bit of cortex abdensationally, all these fails, you can just dial the lens inside the bag and then that would also loosen up the cortex so which, you, which would uh, aid your uh, removal at the end of the high wall implantation. That's one uh, I routinely do and it really works either for FACO or for small incision. Putting the lens inside the bag and then wheeling the lens three, four times inside the bag and that loosens the subincisional cortex, especially when it is very sticky in pseudo exfoliation cases or when your pupil is smaller uh, at the end of your surgery, you can try that. But the key is if you want to do an easy epinucleus cortex removal, you have to make sure your pupil is fully dilated till the end of the surgery. So until then, you have to keep practicing your technique and make yourself uh, a perfect uh, surgeon. Make sure that not even a millimeter, the pupil should come down from the start of your surgery. Even using an intracap, intracameral adrenaline in between, no, is okay, but, but next stage you have to go to that. So you, when you begin and then you learn some of the tips and uh, that is where uh, you, some of these points which uh, the speakers and panelists shared will really help you to take you to that level. Uh, again, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Bill, my co-host, and all the panelists. Uh, they, are, they are very senior and they are all quite busy in the morning uh, in US today. But in spite of that, uh, you joined us for this uh, interesting Thanks. webinar on small incision. Uh, let's hope to Thanks. do it in the future also, seeing the demand and the need for it. Um, thank you again and thanks to all the attendees who have been patiently joining us not only on the Zoom but also uh, on YouTube live and also Facebook live. Uh, any more questions you can always uh, reach to us. We'll be happy to answer. Uh, there are a lot of your colleagues uh, in US who are there in the panel now. You can always write to them. They can throw the questions to us and we can get back to you.
thank you again and uh, have a great day thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, you. bye bye thank you all thank you mm.